Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Thank you for joining me. Uh, uh, each week we have this time to sit down and listen to a story. And we're gonna do that tonight. Our guest is Dr. Brian Cross. Uh, we, we list a lot of things in his past, a, a former Pentecostal, former Reformed Presbyterian Anglican, but uh, uh, Dr. Cross, it's great to have you join us on The Journey Home. It's good to be here, Marcus. All the way from Iowa. That's right. Right. Right, so it's good to have you here. Thank you. I'll get out of the way as soon as I can. Let's let's hear you start your journey, where you came from as a child. Did you have a religious background? I did. I was raised in a Pentecostal tradition. My parents and my grandparents uh, were Pentecostal, and uh, my grandmother is a Pentecostal, still alive. She'll be okay. 100 in about two months. And my my great grandfather, whom I who died when I was 15, he was a Pentecostal pastor as well on my father's side. So that, that takes him back almost to the start of American Pentecostalism. That's right. He was born in the 1890s, and so not too long after the beginning of Pentecostalism. So yeah. that's a rich heritage in my family, and something in a in sense that we're proud of in a way. Uh, the, the piety and the devotion and uh, love for God in my family is something I'm proud of. Yeah, but, and, uh, and we recognize when we look at the statistics that, that still Pentecostalism is one of the, the fastest growing uh, Christian traditions in America. Right, that's right. So it leaves any particular Pentecostal slant, uh, um, you know, sliver in that group? Or? My family, on both sides of my family, it was Church of God, Cleveland, uh, Lee, Lee College, now Lee University. And then uh, growing up, we also went to the Assemblies of God. Okay. So both of those two traditions. All right. Yeah. All right. So from a very early age, you were involved with a very enthusiastic, committed uh, Christian tradition. Right. We would go to church every Sunday morning, but also Sunday nights and Wednesday nights, too. And if there was vacation Bible school, I was in that in the summers and <laughs> any revivals and Sunday school. So uh, we were really uh, focusing a lot on Scripture. So something that's something that we did a lot. I was read Scripture, learn Scripture, and that's something I'm very thankful for because right. uh, growing up, by the time I got to you know high school, I had read the whole Bible and, and was very familiar with all the stories, and, and so that's something that you, know, you can't you can't replace that as a child. It's something that just goes into you. you know, so. Yeah, non-Pentecostal Christians can sometimes be uh, uh, labeled as um, uh, you know strong on the Father, strong on our Lord, and not very strong on the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, almost emphasizing the Trinitarianism minus one mm -hmm. at times, you mm -hmm. know, whereas Pentecostalism can sometimes be the opposite way. Mm -hmm. you know, was, was your experience a good balance? Uh, I think so. I had some good Pentecostal teachers, I mean, <laughs> youth pastors, but also a, a pastor in particular who really focused on Scripture. I think he kept that balance. Yeah. So there was an experiential dimension, a kind of, in a good sense, an awareness of the presence of the Holy Spirit in us all the time. And so a kind of attuned, being attuned to the Spirit, which I think is very valuable, uh, and to just yeah. the presence of right. God, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that we're, my mom would say, you're a temple of the Holy Spirit, right? <laughs> so take care of that temple because uh, there's the Holy Spirit in you. Uh, but at the same time, that that kind of focus on Scripture kept us sort of balanced in that way. Uh, what about you as a young man? What, what, what was, uh, was faith alive? Faith was alive, but I hadn't really internalized it in a way that was personalized until I got to be a senior in high school. And okay. at the end of my senior in high school, I began to take it more seriously and uh, start to ask the Lord what he wanted me to do with my life and uh, who was I living for? You know, was I living just for fun and party or whatever, but, or was I uh, following God and following his direction for my life? So that's the question I began to wrestle with as a senior in high school. Um, you were discerning a call to ministry? At that well, point? Or, just, uh, or just in general? What just in, a, kind of a general, yeah. what does the Lord want to do with me? And just that, that sw that's when the switch really took place from kind of doing what I was, just doing whatever I wanted, but being a Christian on the side, as it were, or that's something I do on Sundays, to, okay, Lord, my life is yours. What do you want me yeah. to do with it? Right? That's the transition that took place then. Um, so I began to ask the Lord, and, and so I... I came to the conclusion that what the Lord wanted me to do was become a missionary, um, but through medical training. So that's what I decided to do. I went to, to college, University of Michigan, and pursued, uh, prepared for studying medicine in medical school so I could become a medical missionary. Hmm. Wow, I mean, that's, you know, it, it does fascinate me, Brian, 
because you're now your professor of philosophy. But if you want to think of it, this, this conviction that you had as a young man, Lord, what do you want me to do? I mean, that's, that, that in itself is a unique philosophical conviction as opposed to what do I want to do? You know, or what, what makes sense in the world? Or what are my gifts? Lord, what do you want me to do? I mean, that, that is a, a unique work of grace in your life as a young man. I agree. Um, I, I think it, it came from uh, the tradition that I was yeah. raised in, that God is God and we are his subjects. And it's not uh, slavery in any kind of negative sense to serve God. It's actually freedom mm -hmm. and joy. And so, Lord, what do you want me to do is the way to f true freedom, true life. And, and I understood that at that point. Thanks be to God, by grace. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, again, the work of grace, right, awakening within you that desire. But yet yeah. you, you still have the freedom to respond to that. You could have said, eh, you know, but no, you, yeah. didn't. you didn't. So, uh, wow, medical missionary. I mean, how far did you get in that path? Well, uh, <laughs> I went to, to university, did a degree in uh, cellular molecular biology, preparing for med school, got into med school at the University of Michigan. So started there, at, and right there is when I got married. I met, met my wife sure. while we were in, in college. And uh, while I was in college too, I should say, I started attending non-denominational uh, services at, in, in Arbor, Michigan there. And um, so I was exposed to, to students and to people of many different Christian traditions, as opposed to more of a Pentecostal exposure when I was younger. Uh, so that already kind of challenged things a little bit. Uh, I knew, I had friends who were Catholics and, and Presbyterians and, and Lutherans, and so that there was a kind of an ecumenical dimension there in Ann Arbor at the time. And um, maybe even a few of your uh, science biology profs trying to uh, undercut your faith a little bit. Uh, I wonder if you had any of that at the, at the State University. I didn't experience that. In fact, at the University of Michigan um, at the time, the anatomy professors, I think, were all Christian. And I think part of that was just the magnificence of the human body. Yeah. It's just hard to, but I knew that, so that was something actually su supportive of the faith. Okay. But, uh, All right. um, but I came to a crisis while I was in medical school, and the crisis was trying to reconcile the science dimension of reality with the human and faith dimension. You mentioned liberal arts earlier, that whole side of reality is something I couldn't fit together. In the mornings, uh, we were doing these mock patient interviews or patient histories where you take a, a medical history of someone and they were just volunteers. And in the afternoon, there were gross anatomy where we're just cutting up cadavers, right? And so I couldn't reconcile, reconcile these two aspects of the day, as it were, because yeah. they didn't seem to fit together. Uh, and what I realize now, I was, I was work wrestling with a philosophy, a kind of scientism that was trying to be comprehensive in its explanation of human function, you know, in terms of science. And I didn't see how to fit that with, with faith and what I knew about uh, just human experience, right? So I decided to leave medical school, which was a very big decision right. at the time, yeah. not knowing how to go forward from there. So we started... You know, I was thinking about the, the, a good, it, it seems to me that a good... Um, image of that is heart and heart. Hmm. You know, we have the heart, that physical thing that you're dealing with in the afternoon, yeah. and then heart, which could be soul, person, right. all of that. How do you put those together? Right, I felt like at the time that I had to choose between them, and I didn't like that choice. Yeah. Because I was, didn't want to be anti-science, but I also didn't want to give up the heart in that sense of the soul, the hu human yeah. person dimension. So, and I didn't know how to reconcile them. I just didn't have the philosophical tools to do it at that yeah. point. All right. Yeah. So uh, we started some, my wife and I, we started a Bible study with um, international students from Indonesia at the time because of that missionary emphasis that yeah. we were thinking about. Um, and then I realized that uh, I didn't really know scripture and theology as well as I needed to. So I decided to go to seminary. And it's during this time that... Uh, I became reformed through reading some books I found at, uh, at the local bookstore. And for the audience, you mean capital R reform? Capital R reform, Presbyterian, right? Calvinist. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I started reading, you know, Calvin and, and some John Gerstner and people like that, and right. um, decided to go to a Protestant seminary, a Presbyterian seminary in uh, St. Louis, Missouri, Covenant Seminary. Covenant. And my wife was from St. Louis anyway, so we could move back there and I could go to seminary, so I did that. But that is a big jump from Pentecostalism, traditional Pentecostalism, it, to that conservative. That's true. Uh, reformed. 
That's true, but uh, I think at the time, the way I looked at it is I was being more true to Scripture, Okay. right? So being faithful to Scripture is what I had always been committed to even in the Pentecostal tradition. So maybe I thought I was taking uh, Romans 9 more seriously in certain passages like that right. that I had sort of just not dealt with very well as a, as a Pentecostal at that age, right? So. So we made the move to, uh, to St. Louis and started seminary and uh, went through four years of seminary. And then my last two years of seminary, I started taking uh, philosophy classes at St. Louis University on the side, as it were, right? <laughs> uh, I started taking graduate cl classes there. Uh, and and St. Louis University isn't a Presbyterian school. Correct. It's a Catholic, it's a Jesuit school, right? Yeah. And um, we started reading um, St. Thomas Aquinas class on the metaphysics of St. Thomas Aquinas. Now, I had done some, a little bit of reading before in the patristics, but this was a different level of study, and just really immersing myself mm -hmm. into Aquinas was a challenge for me as a Protestant, yeah. um, because he's not very Protestant, <laughs> to put it that way. So he was raising points and questions, and the way he appealed to the church fathers, for example, um, sort of bothered me at the time. It bothered me because he treated the church fathers in an authoritative way, and I wanted him to be appealing instead to scripture. Uh, so this troubled me. And I had a, a philosophy teacher at the time who said, um, here's what she said to me. She said, St. Thomas was not a deist about the church. And those words really stuck with me, sort of like a, you know, just got in me, they needled me. <laughs> uh, because I didn't want to be a deist about the church or about God at all. So how did I understand the church fathers? And, and I realized that uh, I had assumed that the church fathers were, had departed in some way from the, the faith handed down by the apostles. Uh, this occurred to me because right after I finished seminary, some Mormons came to our house. Uh, I, mean, I mean, within weeks of graduating from seminary. So it was all fresh, the Greek and the Hebrew, and I thought, okay, I'll just just point them right to scripture. Well, they started coming every week because we were, we just, my wife would invite them in, give them lemonade. <laughs> you know, she's very hospitable. And, uh, but I was completely unsuccessful. Uh, every time I would, I would try to point to scripture, they would point to the Book of Mormon and take a different interpretation. And then I would appeal to the Nicene Creed and they didn't accept that as authoritative. And they'd say, well, we think the church fell away, you know, that, that those people fell away in the first century. And, and I said, well, that's so soon. And they said, well, when do you think the church fell away? I said, well, maybe the fifth or sixth century. And they, I realized that I didn't really have a principled distinction between when I thought the church had fallen away and when they thought the church had fallen away. It's just a few centuries different. And I didn't like that, that I, it was an ad hoc or arbitrary way of deciding when to accept the church and when to not accept yeah. the church and the councils and the creeds. Because there's a multiple uh, ec uh, strong, I mean, convicted explanations of when the f church fell away, depending on what your particular tradition is, whether it's first century, second century, third century, fourth right. century. Our guest is Dr. Brian Cross. I I'm going to back up just a second. Sure. You had said you didn't want to have a deist view of the church. Yeah. Explain that to someone out there, what you meant by not having a deist view of the church. Well, the term deism was very familiar to me as a Protestant, in, right. as a seminarian, because that's one of those views where God just creates the world and then sort of backs away and lets it run on its own. So it's, we contrast theism and deism, right? Where theism is God's providential involvement in the world is continual and constant. And we believe that as Catholics too. Right. God didn't just make the world and let go, but he's continually governing the world and guiding the world providentially. So this idea of deism with regard to the church is that Jesus founds the church you know, and then he just goes up in heaven and says, well, good luck, you know, and so it sort of lets it run on its own and lets it fall off the rails. Yeah. Right, and that uh, the idea that that would be a kind of failure on Christ's part, it would reflect that, in, in a way, it would sort of call into question Christ's divinity. That was the challenge that St. Thomas gave to me, that if Christ is God, then the church that he founded will not go off the rails. And that's how he understood and taught this, this yeah. passion of the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. You know, especially very conservative non-Catholic Christians that want to take a Bible-only perspective and limit what they can know about truth by what's written in here, can almost have a position, just like you said, Jesus chose these 12 guys 
and gave them almost no instructions at all about anything hmm. in the church and run with it, which is why you have, I don't want to mention names, but you can have some very, right now, contemporary liberal uh, New Testament scholars that almost believe that everything that came about in the church was created later, evolved right. later. Right. Everything was a free for all until these councils came around and forced some kind of, quote, orthodoxy on all these free groups. Right. You know, that's a modern running idea. Right. But, but all that's based on this idea of, of a deistic view of understanding the church as God started it, gave it maybe some instructions or none at all. Right. Just kind of let it run. Yeah, we have uh, St. Paul saying that God is not a, a God of disorder, but of order. Right. And so if Christ set up his church, sure, surely he taught them what to do in some sense of how to yeah. set it up. And so there was an orderly way of handing on doctrine, handing on practice, handing on authority. Uh, yeah, yeah. And this, this other thing that you talked about, and you go out evangelizing, and you're going you're gonna to use this book as authority. You know, it says here, yeah. but if, if that person doesn't hold this book as authoritative, then that argument doesn't hold any water. Right. Right. Yeah, which is what you were encountering with those Mormons. Right. With the Book of Mormon in their case. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So what happened then at that point uh, with, for you with the, the Mormons and the, you, you, I mean, the issue was you didn't want to have a deist view of the church. Right. And um, it's, this is a long process. It doesn't happen right. overnight. So right. It, right. It, it just wrestled with that. How do I avoid this? Uh, deist view of the church. It came, I came to see that really there were two different pictures or, or paradigms is the term I would use now. And I had been working in one paradigm, this idea of that, well, the church fell away and here's where we turn to now and that's how we derive doctrine. Uh, but then I started to see a different paradigm as I turned to the church fathers. Um, this took a little bit, this was a little bit down the road. I wasn't fully reading the Church Fathers yet. I was just reading Aquinas. That led me into the Church Fathers. But in the meantime, I became an Anglican. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. so uh, after seminary, my, young, my youngest daughter was born and she was very sick. So she had to be in the hospital and uh, she almost died. She was, it was a very difficult situation oh. with her. So there was a, a period of time where I was um, not even attending a church. She was immunodeficient, so we were trying to protect her in the hospital from germs. And, but, but also I was just really wrestling with um, these deeper theological questions. I was, when I was attending church, I found myself thinking, this is still a Presbyterian yeah. church, I was thinking, you know, I could be learning Augustine or reading a, a Aquinas or something, and I, I don't want to, I was dealing with theology up here, and religion was all up here in my yeah. head. And my head was getting in the way. And so I found myself critiquing sermons in an unhelpful, unhealthy way. And uh, my friends, one friend of my friends said to me, why don't you just go visit an Anglican church? And I said, okay, I'll, I'll try it. And so I did. I went over to uh, one of the nearby Anglican churches and I, I just walked in. I knelt down in the pew with a kneeler. And I was so moved by the liturgy and, and by the, the communion, uh, just because it didn't address me propositionally, primarily. The propositions were there in the liturgy, of right. course, but it was the words of God being said in the liturgy, not human speculation, I'll put it that way. And the way Christ was presented to me was in the sacrament, right, in the communion. So I couldn't argue with that. Right, it wasn't something I could hold an objection to. It was here I am, you know, in a kind of participatory way. Christ is giving to me, giving Himself to me. So it bypassed this whole intellectual obstacle that my mind was putting up, and allowed me just to to pray and to feel more um, with God again. Um, so the liturgy was a way of the introduction of the liturgy was a way of kind of really helping me hold on to the faith at that time. Mm -hmm when my daughter was sick. Oh, well, was your wife on the same journey with you at the time? Not so much at the same time. Yeah. Um, so she was still going to uh, the Presbyterian Church, and so that created some tension with us for a while. Yeah. Um, but I said to her, I, I just never want to go. I never want to leave the liturgy, is what I said. I want to hang on to the liturgy. I recognized, too, that the liturgy was something that has this long history in the church, right. and it goes way back. So discovering it was like discovering something that had been hidden to me. Yeah. I was going to say, moving from Pentecostalism to, to Reform Presbyterianism, 
to Anglicanism is a is a journey into liturgy, is a journey right. into history right. for you. I mean, going back deeper and deeper into right. a, a historical faith. Right, so it's always like there's something more, there's something more, I keep peeling things back. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, so um, eventually we, we, my wife was, came to terms with us a bit by becoming Anglican, and we, we found something that we could agree on, and we, we joined the Anglican Church, and um, shortly thereafter, um, I started really reading the Church Fathers, you know, really just pouring myself into them as much as I could, everything I could get my hands on. And um, a friend of mine um, said to me, well, why aren't you Catholic? Yeah, he didn't say you should become Catholic. He just said, well, why aren't you Catholic? And I tried to give him some immediate uh, answers, but I wasn't, wasn't satisfied myself with those answers. Um, answers like Mary and the papacy and purgatory and things like this. And, but I thought, well, I'm kind of just begging the question. That's, that was my philosophical internal. <laughs> I'm just presupposing precisely what's in question. And so uh, I was dissatisfied with that because I, I knew it wasn't an intellectually honest answer. It just happened to be where I was, right? Uh, and I had other friends too. We were talking about uh, ecumenical questions. We, we were interested in church unity, but then we, we were thinking, well, should we become a Catholic or not? Well, no, if we became Catholic, that would betray this idea that we're all Catholic with a small c, you know, whatever denomination or tradition that we're in. And we wanted to affirm and hang on to that idea of Catholic with a small c. So the particularity of Catholicism with a capital C, <laughs> that was a bit scandalous to me still at the time. Um, but then as an Anglican, uh, first reading the Church Fathers and then seeing how they understood ecclesiology. Uh, for example, the idea of schism. And I saw schism, this idea of schism in St. Augustine with the Donatists and Novatians earlier. Right, and St. Jerome and Origen talks about schism and St. Optatus talks about schism. And schism, this concept of schism as a, in addition to heresy, as something distinct from heresy, was something I had never really thought about and studied uh, as a Protestant. And it bothered me because it, it showed that the church was not just this kind of um, uh, set or collection of people who either were elect or were professed the same creed or faith or something, but there was a visibility to the church, right? A kind of hierarchy, and you could be in fellowship or you could be out of fellowship. Even if you had the same beliefs as Augustine, the Donatist, it wasn't like they had different heretical beliefs so much. It was it's just they were not in communion. And so that, that picture of the church as being a visible church, that was part of this new paradigm that I hadn't discovered before. Yeah. So you, that's one thing. You, know, you think about that first Corinthians 3 passage where Paul is um, being critical of the Corinthians because they're they're dividing up in these groups. I'm of Paul. I'm of Peter right. of Cephas. You know, yeah. I'm of Jesus. You know, and and it, it, it's true. He isn't so much dealing with a heresy here. Yeah, but he's dealing with with the, the seedbed of of schism. Right. You know, I'm not I'm not united with you. I'm not, there's no unity with you, and that's what he's attacking. I mean, right. he's also in other places talking about bad doctrine, but he's attacking that schism. And uh, so the heresy can lead to schism, is the danger of heresy. Uh, but you could be schismatic and yet hold the exact same doctrine. Right, right. Yeah, so the problem is this unity which we share in Christ the, 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 that we can't touch. Augustine was pretty strong about that. He was. He was. Uh, I mean, it's it's like a it's a grave matter for them. Uh, schism, yeah. um, and, and that's. I mean, I understood those passages from St. Paul in in a kind of um, local church way only. You know, so this church breaks with this church, and that's bad, and we shouldn't let. It. But I never understood them in a universal sense. The idea of not just separation from another particular church, but separation from the Catholic Church. Yeah. Right, so that concept was one that was new to me hmm. and troubling to me. Because when I got to the creed, we'd say the creed every week, right, and uh, on Sunday, and I would say, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I started to realize that when I said the word one, I wasn't saying it in the same sense that I saw in the early church fathers. Hmm. And that dishonesty forced me eventually to just stop speaking at the time, that point every Sunday when we got to that part of the creed. I just couldn't say the, that word, one, because I knew that I, when I was saying it, I was 
equivocating on the term. I was yeah. making it have a different meaning than it had for them. I was using it in the sense of we're all one, no matter how s separated we are in terms of communion, but they meant it in terms of communion, right? And so I wasn't really being truthful if I said it in, in, it had a different sense to the term, right, if that makes right. sense. Yeah. And I'm guessing it isn't just that you were uncomfortable with the the falsity of claiming oneness in relationship to Catholics and other Christians, but even within Anglicanism. Yeah. I, mean, I guess you were probably aware of of the problems within Anglicanism. I mean, we're... Right. I don't want to point fingers at this point, no, but that's a struggle. It is, right, for sure. Uh, and so merely being a collection of churches isn't the same thing. No. Uh, no. Yeah, and, but, but already even as an Anglican, the, the transition from Presbyterian to Anglican required believing something about apostolic succession that I hadn't recognized before as a Presbyterian. So I started looking at the, the question of ordination and what does that mean and okay. what did the church fathers teach about ordination? And that study kind of really was another point that really shifted me over toward. Had you at that point still thinking about ordination? Um, no, this was after that. Okay, so you were no yeah. that was no longer a personal right. issue that you were considering. Okay. That's right, wow. yeah. Right after I left seminary, right as I was leaving seminary, I decided not to pursue ordination. Right. Right. Uh, so at this point, it was just, well, what, what is a genuine ordination, right? And who, who gets to decide that? And how did the church fathers answer this question? And so that, you know, you have to distinguish between a, an authentic ordination and an inauthentic or, in or, ordination. And, well, that's a really important question. You can just, nowadays, you can just mail something in and get ordained, right? And, and so, well, okay, that's obviously wrong. So what counts as a genuine ordination? And that led me to the doctrine of apostolic succession. Um, so now we have apostolic succession, we have a distinction between bishops and priests and, and all that. And so that's how I could accept that as an Anglican at that point. But still the question of unity persisted because if you have multiple bishops and they're not in communion, well, where is yeah. the church Christ founded? Right, yeah. right. I think it is true that in the early church writings, it's not always clear uh, between the designations of bishop and priest, yeah. th th there's some overlap. Right. Except for at least one area, only the bishops could ordain. Right, that's right. And even the terminology sort of overlapped the first century and even into the second century. As time went on, the church was clarifying that distinction and concept. Um, and that's a fascinating study in right, itself. Right, right, <laughs> yeah. right. right. Yeah, but this issue of ordination, as you said, this, this was pretty singular from the beginning in terms of who had the authority to do that. Right. And you couldn't just, I mean, I know as a Protestant, and I'm, it might have been true in Pentecostalism, you take that scripture, wherever two or more gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of you, okay, well, that's a church. Right. Wherever a couple people gathered, right. and then laying out of hands, that constituted ordination, and there was no sense of, uh, do I have the qualifications to do this? Right. And if I was just using scripture to answer that question, sure, you can see how that answer would come about. But what changed for me was, okay, I'm not just using scripture to answer this question. What did the church fathers teach about that? How did they practice this? And if that has some authority and weight, that changes how you answer this question. Right. Yeah. Right. Brian, why don't we pause right now? It's sure. time for a break. We'll take a breather, and then we'll come back and find out your next step as you dealt with okay. the apostolic succession and, and the ordination. We'll see you back. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and our guest is Dr. Brian Cross. And uh, I've interrupted you in the middle of your journey, and sure. the, you've just dealt with uh, some of the awakenings besides becoming Anglican, going deep and deeper in history in terms of uh, liturgy and historical um, connection with early church fathers. I mean, the, the Anglicans are, are committed to unity of the church and with the first ecumenical councils, right. you know, where the rest of Protestantism right. might not make that, so you're going back. But in your study of ordination and apostolic succession, it's opening your heart to a, a bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember one conversation I had with the Anglican bishop in which I asked him, how come, why do we accept these councils and not these, you know? And I, I was disappointed with his answer because it seemed to me not principled. 
Mm -hmm. So it seemed kind of um, a bit arbitrary. Now I, I understand that the, their, you know, Anglican confessions, you know, and, and the Thirty Nine Articles and so on. But the same attitude. Uh, here's I'll tell you a story from seminary. So in seminary, we, I took a class on the Westminster Confession of Faith, okay. right? and it's a preparation class for. So at the end of the class, toward the end of the semester, we we're supposed to um, list out all our exceptions, exceptions we take to the confession. And I had a few more than, than others did at the time. <laughs> <laughs> but some people had more and some people had less, and it depended. But uh, I think this experience allowed me to see that the confession was not itself authoritative because you can just take exceptions to it. And one of the fellow students, I, he saw my list of confessions, uh, con exceptions, and he said, well, why are you even here? <laughs> like, why don't you, what he meant by that was, why don't you, you study at a seminary that meets more where, where you're coming from, right? So you don't have to take so many exceptions. And he meant it in a good way. Yeah. But the comment sort of was eye-opening to me because it re I realized, you know, we're just, um, we're, we're t interpreting scripture, and then we're picking a confession that matches scripture, and then we're identifying that uh, confession as authoritative. And I thought that's sort of sort of self-deceptive in a way. It's sort of, it's not truthful in a way. It's yeah. not really authoritative a confession if we're just picking it because it matches our interpretation. Uh, and so that was something that I realized then to some degree, but it became more clear as I went on. And I wanted to apply the same. Of, uh, argument to this idea of picking councils and not, oh, right. you know what I mean? So if we, if we accept the fourth ecumenical council, Chalcedon, how come we don't accept the seventh? I mean, right. is it because it doesn't match our interpretation? Well, then who's really authoritative here? Not the councils. So let's just not pretend. Let's just go right back to the Bible. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned Westminster Confession. I was very much a Westminster Confession okay. guy in my conservative Presbyterian and Calvinism. And it, one thing struck me is that and looking back on my own journey, you know what was what was abandoned in the Reformation was the authority of bishops, the authority to discern, in union with Peter, the meaning of Scripture. Mm -hmm. All right, they had the authority. So if you, okay, the Westminster Confession basically says that the, the authority is Scripture, but in the original languages. So the people that had authority were the people who could interpret, who could read the original languages. Mm -hmm. So if you're a common Christian and you want to know what the Bible say, well, you're going to those that can read the Greek and the Hebrew. They were the authorities. Right. So instead of bishops, you have the scholars. Right. I totally agree. Uh, that shifts the locus of authority, as we say, right? Yeah. And um, I think this is one of those other aspects of the two paradigms I mentioned earlier. In the seminary as a Presbyterian, the way we approached questions of theology and doctrine was, well, let's do some exegesis, right? right? Let's get out the exegetical tools and we can solve this problem that way. And while I was in seminary, I realized that uh, exegesis alone doesn't do this. It doesn't live up to this con uh, standard of being able to resolve these disputes, interpreter of disputes. Right. Um, well, t history testifies to that. but. Uh, you know, there's another, there was another Lutheran seminary in town, Concordia, and so we would occasionally talk with these fellows, and they, they know exegesis as well, and they come to different interpretations, so exegesis just wasn't enough. Uh, I also saw, because I was taking philosophy classes at the same time, I saw, I learned to see, I came to see that philosophy or philosophical assumptions were doing a lot of the interpretive work, but we just didn't acknowledge that because we didn't see it. So we were bringing assumptions to the text and then drawing an interpretation and treating that interpretation as authoritative, but the, the, the work that's being done is by what we were bringing to the text yeah. philosophically. Yeah. And so long as we weren't identifying those assumptions, they just kind of remained invisible and we didn't see, oh, that's what's really doing the interpretive work. Um, and so then seeing that was like, oh my goodness, I, I want to be able to, this is one of the reasons why I decided to study philosophy, I want to, not only identify the philosophical assumptions I'm bringing to Scripture, yeah. but I wanted to make sure that they're good ones. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy, and you, know, you talk about being blind to the stuff you bring to, not only the philosophies, but if you're doing the exegesis and that idea that as a Presbyterian, okay, I'm, I'm doing the exegesis, so I'm cutting through all these other ideas. I'm doing the exegesis, so I've got the Greek, or I've got the Hebrew. 
but obviously I'm not a perfect scholar. I need helps. So I bring over my, my Bauer, Art, and Gingrich, or whatever that, that big right. dictionary was, so that I'm looking at that Greek word to know what it really means, not what this, this committee said, but what that Greek, well, I'm, but I'm depending on this other authority. Right. I'm depending on the guy that wrote that dictionary. Did he bring with it philosophical assumptions? Right. So it, it, it's a long chain of assumptions that we brought with us that we're blind to. Right. And even the, 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 the lexicon brings with it certain theological assumptions, not just philosophical assumptions. So um, yeah. I ha I've th written a little article titled The Tradition of the Lexicon, how this is, again, two parts of the paradigm. In that Protestant mindset, I would go to the lexicon as the way of answering these kind of questions in exegesis. Yeah. And then in the Catholic paradigm, you turn to tradition. You know, what do the church fathers teach about this, right? Well, then these two methods, um, the, the lexical method presupposes implicitly that the church father's answer is not correct. Where do the lexicographers get their answers to these questions? Well, they look at word usage at the same time period, but it's not necessarily the, the word usage in the church. It could be just general word right. usage, right? So there's a certain theological assumption there that what the church understood by that term or how that term developed by the guidance of the Holy Spirit, that's not an authoritative way of taking that term, understanding that term. Rather, we have to use scholarly methods. And, the, and that's yeah. theologically loaded. That, that's the yeah. distinction I realized at the time. Okay, these are two different methods. I'm hoping the audience is picking up on what you're saying. In other words, at, at the core, there's a bit of an anti-Catholic assumption as a thread through all that. Built right into the methodology. Right. Yeah. 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 Now, I'm not denying the usefulness of lex lexicon. I right. still turn to them, right? But I, I look at them in the context with the Church Fathers. Yeah. All right. So there you were in the midst of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this was still me as an Anglican. Okay. And uh, this was 2004 or so when I, my friend said, why aren't you Catholic? And I threw myself into the Church Fathers, uh, probably more than, than I should have being in grad school at the time, right. right? Sort of neglecting certain other things. But uh, by the time 2005 rolled around, I was becoming more and more convinced, let's put it this way, I was having a more difficult time finding reasons not to be Catholic. Okay. Um, and then in April 2005, Pope John Paul II died. Yeah. And he was someone I respected, not just as, a, as the Pope, but, but as a philosopher too. In fact, I had used mm -hmm. one of his texts, Love and Responsibility, in one of the classes I was teaching at the time. So, uh, and I also had an experience earlier because he came to St. Louis in 1999 <laughs> and spoke there. And, and uh, one of my teachers said, hey, I've got two extra tickets, we'd like to go. And as a Protestant, I was like, well, sure. <laughs> so I got to go to, to the mass there uh, as a Protestant. And, uh, you know, I think I feel kind of guilty about that because I'm sure there are other Catholics <laughs> who didn't get to go. And there I was as a Protestant going to this. But, uh, you know, just being there you know, in his presence and hearing him talk and seeing him now, you know, saint. Yeah. And uh, then when he died, I felt a kind of closeness to him. It's hard to explain mm -hmm. that, but a uh, deep gratitude for who he was, what he had done, even as a Protestant, I felt that. Yeah. Um, and so I was kind of riveted to the, all the ceremonies and funeral, and saw constant coverage on television at the time. Um, and uh, then I followed while Pope Benedict was elected, and that was around April 20th. And I remember April 22nd, it was a Friday, I was sitting in my carol at St. Louis University, and uh, I, I reached that final point where I had no further reason not to be Catholic. <laughs> and I realized, I can't do this anymore. The Catholic Church is the church Christ founded, and I have to join her. And so I, I pulled back from my seat and I stood up and I walked up the street to uh, College Church St. Xavier and I walked into the back of the church and I was just looking for a pamphlet on how to become Catholic. <laughs> I know that sounds <laughs> silly, but uh, it's like, how to become Catholic in the back. And that was, as I was there, I heard a, a voice, uh, a friend, friend's voice. He said, Brian, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm trying to figure out how to become Catholic. And he said, and he was a Catholic. And he said, really? And he just gave me a bear hug. And uh, he sort of helped me out from there. So that was uh, the turning point for me. But uh, when I went home and, and told my wife this, she, uh, mm -hmm. let's say that she cried. Yeah. <laughs> she was not happy because she had a negative experience growing up in her neighborhood. Uh, Catholics weren't a good example for her where she grew up. And so she thought, 
that being Catholic meant losing your faith or not being faithful. And so it took a little while for her. We, um, we started reading the Church Fathers together. We got to know some other Catholics who were solid people. And, and she realized that, we, all, we both realized that to be um, a practicing Catholic is not, a, it's not enough just to go through the motions, right? There's a whole life of virtue that that's actually what it means to be Catholic, right? So yeah. the example that she had was a, a negative example, but it wasn't necessitated by being Catholic. Um, and so that, that helped out. So then in uh, 2006, we started going through our RCA in 2005. By 2006, uh, the Monsignor said, I think you're ready. And so we were received uh, on October 8th, 2006. All right. Yeah. Talk about, if you would, um, well, I got a lot of things I want to talk to you about. I don't have time, you know, but uh, one of them is your wife's resistance. And you had a resistance to get over. Um, we live in a we live in a soup of anti-Catholicism in America. Talk about that a little bit. Did you experience that? I mean, it wasn't necessarily verbal anti-Catholicism in your Pentecostal big background, your Pentecostal Presbyterian, your Anglican, but but there's an assumption there. Um, I experienced it this way. Um, when I became Presbyterian, there was very no pushback from relatives or friends or neighbors, anybody. When I became Anglican, there was no pushback at all. But when I said I was becoming Catholic, I immediately got pushback. Hmm. Um, even on the day I was to be received, I got a phone call from a relative, you know, just begging me not to do it. And people started writing me and, and yeah. saying, you know, think twice about this and, and understand their concern. But there's clearly a line that yeah. this was departing from you know, the broader Protestant perspective. Yeah, it's, it's a part of our American heritage, yeah. if you will. Um, and I want to talk to you then about philosophy. Sure. I mean, I mean, there's this, on the one hand, there's kind of this underlying um, uh, you know, anti-Catholicism in our heritage. There's a little bit of that about philosophy, too, in our culture, especially in our, in our non-Christian tradition in America. Did mm -hmm. you have a little bit of that, too? Oh, sure. Um, I think that uh, the way that I was trying to get around that, even as a Protestant, was from Scripture, you know, so that we can avoid all those worldly philosophies. You know, philosophy was of the world. It was a worldly thing, and it's foolish in the eyes of God. You know, so this is wisdom, and philosophy is foolish. But I know I, 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 that's the way I saw it as a Protestant. Right. But then as a Catholic, well, especially through Aquinas, right, yeah. St. Thomas, um, I started to see that... Um, Philosophy can be done well or can be done poorly. Mm -hmm. And bad philosophy is very damaging and dangerous. But good philosophy is really important and helpful. And there's a line from Aristotle in one of his fragments, I believe. He says, uh, you say you must not philosophize, you philosophize. You say you must philosophize, you philosophize. Either way, you philosophize. In other words, you can't avoid philosophy. <laughs> philosophizing. You just, yeah. we do it. So the question is whether we're going to do it well or poorly. Right, that's the only question. And so um, in our time, I think, at least in, in the U.S. and the West, we tend to neglect philosophy. And yeah. there's some, some of that is on us, I mean, for philosophers who have not done well with philosophy. But we're very much a pragmatic people, so we focus on getting things done, right? And so we focus on skills and technical areas, which is good. And then we, we have theology on their side, or Sunday morning, and we have a difficult time integrating those two things. So we tend to compartmentalize. Um, faith is over here, and work is over here, and skill, and life, and amusement, and science, and engineering, and everything that's over here. <clears throat> philosophy serves as a bridge between those two. Um, and so when philosophy drops out of the picture, then that bridge is gone, and you get that compartmentalization. Hmm. Uh, and if you study the early church fathers, I mean, no, you, you know this, uh, they recognized the role that philosophy played in preparing the, the coming of Christ among the Greeks, especially. <clears throat> so, you know, Plato and Socrates and prepared the way for seeing beyond just the material world. You know, so the ancient uh, pre-Socratic Thales and everything is made out of water and in Eximenes, everything's made out of air. So they're very much materialists. Whereas when you get to Plato, he sees that there's more to reality than just matter. Well, that's already preparing the way for, for Christ, right? right? And so. The early church fathers, at what point, I assume they did, recognize that these early Greek philosophies were in, was in fact the grace of God? 
I mean, did, at what point do they recognize us? They're merely smart guys back there, that it was the work of God in, in the minds of these uh, pre-Christian. You can see this already in the second century. St. Justin Martyr talks about this. St. Clement of Alexandria ended the second century. Uh, Origen talks about it. Augustine talks about it. Um, now there was some controversy of right, you know, Tertullian, what does Jerusalem have to do with Athens? So yeah. he was trying to push back a little bit, but that's because he didn't want to uh, allow for, he was trying to protect against paganization you know, of Christianity. But uh, I think the idea of providence, again, going back to deism, yeah. Right, the church fathers were, were not deists, even about what took place before the coming of Christ. Right, so all the things that took place among the pagans, this idea, you, you have kind of figures of uh, Christ and figures of Mary in the, uh, well, they saw those as God the Father preparing for the coming of Christ. Uh, these are uh, the gold of the Egyptians, as it were, that the church thought they could take and, and build on and, and use as a bridge even to, to speaking to you know, the pagans, as St. Paul yeah. did with the Athenians. Um, how do you help us, audience and me, uh, make sure we're doing good philosophy? <laughs> if, you, if that's the problem, doing bad philosophy, well, how do you, how do you make sure you're doing good philosophy? Well, I <laughs> this is a great question, <laughs> it's a big question, um, because we can't all become professional philosophers, right? right? right. And it's a difficult subject, it's, a, it's one of the most difficult subjects because it's not tangible, right? Yeah. Um, I think one thing here is to uh, follow the church. I mean, th this is an encyclical by Pope St. John the Paul II, Fides Eratio, in which it's all about faith and philosophy. I know it's faith and reason in the title, but he wrote that encyclical about philosophy. That's what it's about. And I think if we follow the church's guidance on philosophy, that will help steer us in the right direction. That's what I'd say as a short answer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, my favorite scripture text, which I, if anyone's watched the journey home, you've heard me say this too many times, I'm sorry, is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, uh, which in a way I've, it may be a false guy, but to me it's, it is the, some of the first steps for doing good philosophy. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Mm. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He'll direct your paths. Right. I mean, that's a way of entering into good philosophy. I'm trusting the Lord. And that also means trusting that the church he gave us isn't, and not leaning on my own understanding. That's where we get ourselves in trouble philosophically. Right, and even that line right there indicates that trying to do philosophy or think philosophically just by myself alone in that individualistic way, that would be a way to go off track very easily. So if I'm gonna be doing philosophy, I wanna be standing on the shoulders of all those who've come before me, right? So that's a kind of, rec it's a kind of humility, right? I'm gonna to approach philosophy by looking at what those who came before me have said and done and trying to build on it rather than just starting from scratch. So. Uh, a big battle in philosophy, I'm not a philosophical historian, I wish I knew more in that, but it was between the continuing Platonic ideas that I think Augustine was more into, and then Aquinas, which, who was more Aristotle. Uh, talk about the importance of the church to make sure that we understand that we're getting this philosophy correct. Because even in these great fathers, Augustine and Aquinas, we have a bit of a battle on how to apply the early Greek philosophies. Right, so I would say um, what uh, Pope John Paul II says in Fides Eratio, he uses the term perennial philosophy. And so there's a broad perennial philosophy that's inside the church, I call it the Catholic philosophical tradition. So it's broad. Inside that broad tradition, there are debates, such as the one you just mentioned. And that's fine, there are debates. But there's also debates that go beyond that. So for example, skepticism or, or nihilism, that there's no purpose or meaning in life. Well, that's outside the range of Catholic philosophical tradition. It engages it, but that's, if you've crossed that line to nihilism, right, where there's no yeah. meaning or purpose, then you've left that philosophical tradition that's inside the church. So there's in-house debates, and then there's those that are outside that tradition. Hopefully that distinction is helpful. All right, good. Our, our guest is Dr. Brian Cross, just again as we, as we get towards the close. Um, there were, what would you, when you look back, you, you had a conversion, if you will, into philosophy from your Pentecostalism. And then later you had a conversion to liturgy, which, right? I mean, that was what mm -hmm. that was. And then, of course, a conversion to the authority of the church. Right. What, what was the hardest barrier 
to oh. get over for you? Or, or did you have a bunch of them? But what would you say was the hardest uh, to get over from this, you, you, the history you brought with you into the church? I think I would say it's not just one thing, but a whole package. So seeing everything at, like a paradigm, as yeah. I mentioned earlier, two paradigms. Once the paradigm picture falls into place, then you can see, oh my goodness, it's a whole shift. But if you don't see it that way, if you, if you take all the questions piecemeal, one at a time, uh, then you can try to answer them by presupposing the paradigm you're already in, which just begs the question. So you have to be able to see both pictures, both paradigms, and then you can see, oh my goodness, it all fits together over here. <laughs> yeah. All right. We have an email, Ralph from uh, Kansas City. In my study of ecclesiology, I haven't been able to convince myself of the need for a visible hierarchical church. It just seems uh, that wasn't what Jesus was intending when he was preaching the kingdom. What are some of the reasons Catholics are so insistent on the visible nature of the church? It appears more reasonable that the church is an invisible reality since we really can't know who is a true follower of Christ as opposed to someone who is uh, only making an outward show of belief. Mm. Well, that's true about the judging the heart. We can't know somebody's heart, so that's true. But um, again, how we know about the visibility of the church is from the church fathers. So the Christian faith is something received, not constructed. So we don't construct it according to, well, how would I organize the church if I were in charge, right? That, that would be a man-made way of approaching it, kind of a consumeristic way of approaching it. Uh, rather, we, we receive it. So how did Christ set up the church, yeah. right? Well, he set it up as a hierarchy, with a hierarchical unity, with apostles and with you know bishops and deacons and priests and so on. And the reason for that, in part, was because we needed, uh, well, we're, we're visible, we're <laughs> we ourselves are physical organisms, right? So um, we're, we're not just ghosts or immaterial beings. Now there's an immaterial dimension to the church, of course, right. the, the Holy Spirit is the soul of the church. but. Uh, Take, for example, doctrine. Well, how are we going to dis resolve these doctrinal disputes? Well, we need some kind of visible hierarchical organ that can do that. Uh, what about discipline? How are we going to deal with that? Well, that's not something that an invisible church can do, right? So right. questions of doctrine and discipline, they demand a visible church. Yeah, it seems to me that, as you mentioned earlier, if you have a kind of a deistic view of the church, whether you call it that or not, in other words, you believe that, you know, okay, Christ started something, but he didn't establish anything physical. You eventually end up with a Gnostic view of spirituality even. In other words, we ourselves, it's our, our spirits are trapped in this body of ours. I, I completely agree with that, um, Marcus. I think that the, one of the reasons why in today's time we seek a lot of confusion about who we are as human persons, just in our culture around us, right, that there's the idea of, um, what's called expressive individualism, where I just decide what I'm going to be, and I think of my body as the car that I drive in, and I can just do whatever I want with it. Um, so it's a failure to recognize that this body is part of me, it's part of my identity, that I am an embodied being. That's who I am, that's how I'm created, that's how we're all created. Well, if we take that same ecclesiology that's disembodied and, and Gnostic, as you say, no wonder we have this difficulty. We can't confront this philosophical mistake about who we are and at the same time endorse a, a disembodied ecclesiology. Yeah, and just as I am an embodied soul, and I'm not very perfect, well, the church is a bunch of embodied souls. <laughs> I mean, there we are, we are very perfect, all in need of gr <laughs> That's right. grace and, and forgiveness and, and, uh, uh, and humility, you know, which is, in my view, probably the most important characteristic a good philosopher needs, right? Well, this is right, how Socrates begins. I know that I don't know, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know We've got what, 40 seconds to go. Your okay. website, uh, called to communion.com. Tell the audience about that. Well, this is something that a group of us set up, uh, people who converted mostly from the Reformed tradition. Back in on Ash Wednesday of 2009, okay. we started called to communion, so it's been around for a while. But the goal was to, to create a forum in which we could have dialogue to resolve these disagreements? How can we move forward in a positive way in a, an environment that was charitable and gracious and not hostile and in, a, in you know, that kind of setting? So it, it's, it requires a commitment to charity, mutual charity, and to pursuing the truth in love. 
uh, and, yeah. and celebrating what we sh share, our baptism, our love for Christ, right. scriptures, but not going to indifferentism where it says, oh, it doesn't matter. Exactly that middle path right That's there. Right. Yeah. Dr. Cross, what a great, great, great pleasure Thank you, to have you on the program. And, uh, and I encourage the audience to go to your website called thecommunion.com to connect with you and hear what other things you're saying in your blogs and discussions. Thank you. Thank great you very much. And God bless you in your, in your work as a professor of philosophy. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I do pray that Dr. Cross's journey is an encouragement to you, my friend. God bless you. See you next week.